Ahlan wa salam. Good evening, everyone. Um, it is an absolute pleasure to welcome you all here tonight. Sorry, I can't see for the light. I apologize. Uh, welcome you here tonight uh, for the Kicks Visiting Author Program and Safia El Hilal. Thank you. <laughs> Firstly, I would like to welcome a warm welcome to Safia's family, who must be so proud. This is, I've understood, the first official performance on Sudanese soil. Secondly, thank you to Dahl Group who have sponsored this and helped with the logistics. Um, it would be remiss of me to stand here and try to describe work so vivid and alive when it is, explains itself perfectly. Safia, the stage is yours. Hi, assalamu alaikum. This is love. <laughs> um, it's uh, truly such a pleasure and also such an honor um, to be here speaking to you all today. It's very surreal. I actually can't believe this is happening. Um, so if I'm dreaming, don't tell me. Don't wake me up. Um, my name is Safia al Hilo. I'm Sudani, I'm Mia Mia. But uh, I come to you from Los Angeles, California. Um, and uh, so I was told this was a community lecture, and uh, a lecture is not usually in the repertoire of things I particularly know how to do. Um, the joke is that I've never written a full sentence in my life. Um, but uh, I thought for the sake of the newness and the first time uh, of this whole occasion that I would try, but I would try my version, which is um, that some of it I will be speaking in full sentences and some of it I will be uh, reading a poem, but I won't tell you where it's happening. So um, maybe you'll be able to follow it along. But all this to say that uh, this is a bit of an experiment, so I hope you'll bear with me. The lyrics do not translate. Arabic is all verbs for what stays still in other languages. Tasbah to mourning, what the translation to awake cannot honor, cannot contain its rhyme with tasbah, to swim, to make the night a body of water. I am here now, and I am not buoyant. I am 32 and always sick, small for my age and always translating. I cannot sleep through the night. No language has given me the rhyme between ocean and wound that I know to be true. Sometimes, when the doctors draw my blood, I feel the word at the edge of my tongue. Halim sings agraq, agraq. I am drowning, I am drowning. The single word for all the water in his throat does not translate. Halim sings, teach me to kill the tear in its duct. Halim sings, I have no experience in love, nor have I a boat. And I know he cannot rest, cannot swim through the night. I am looking for a voice with a wound in it, a man who could only have died by a form of drowning. Let the song take its time. Let the ocean close back up. I was born in Rockville, Maryland, in the United States of America, to Sudanese parents, which I guess would make me a first-generation Sudanese American, a child of immigrants. But then we kept going. Over the 10 years that followed, we lived in Nairobi, Kenya, Dar es Salaam, Tanzania, Cairo, Egypt, Brighton, England, and Geneva, Switzerland, before finally settling in Washington, D.C. in the summer of 2000. Then, in the fall of 2008, my mother moved to Cairo for a second time, with my brother joining her in the summer of 2009, while I moved to New York City to start college. We continue to add cities to our list. I now live in Los Angeles after spending two years in Oakland, in California's Bay Area. And with every new place added to that list, I get further away from any answer to that question of where I can call home, of where I can claim. As a result, I've harbored a near lifelong obsession with what to call myself, reaching for the existing terms and finding in them only loose approximations. I hear children of immigrants talk about being children of immigrants, and I think, me too, almost, sort of. My parents never completely immigrated to the US and instead have spent the years of my life in and out of that country. 
I hear immigrants talk about being immigrants, and I also think, me too, almost, sort of. I did not technically immigrate to the US because I was born there, but we left after I was born. So then I myself had the experience years later of coming to America, the shock of it. And not that I ever fancied myself able to speak for whole demographics, but on the occasion that I am asked to speak to the immigrant experience or about being a child of immigrants, I want to tell the person doing the asking that they might be asking the wrong person. What title can I claim? Almost immigrant, child of almost immigrants, almost Sudanese and almost American. I felt myself adrift for years in languagelessness, devouring books and hoarding words in an attempt to collage myself a reflection somewhere. Here, in one book, was a character who had curly hair like I do, but she was white. Here was a character who had an accent like I do, but it was because she was fluent in a different language. I felt like I was made of all those discarded details, the ones I couldn't find written down anywhere. So in the world outside, I was always an other, with a capital O, always newly arrived to some country that was not my own. And then in the books I would turn to for shelter, for comfort, I was an other. As a young reader, I read everything I could get my hands on, read hungrily, waiting for that hot spark of recognition, and was met with hundreds of almosts, of not quites, which I'm sure is a familiar feeling for many young readers, particularly those of color, because it's not that everyone else is so well represented and I am just so different. I couldn't find myself in books because there were not enough books. It's not that I didn't exist, it's that the book I needed to read to see myself, to see my life and my experiences and my intersections as deserving of literature, did not yet exist. Enter the famous Toni Morrison quote, which I love as does everyone else. If there's a book that you want to read, but it hasn't been written yet, then you must write it. So I did. I wrote hundreds of poems, then a book of poems called The January Children. And then I wrote the book I want to talk a little bit about today, which is called Home is Not a Country. And it is a novel in verse, a hybrid form, a genre in the hyphen between genres to express the feeling of being in between worlds. The question that is usually asked of people who are hyphenated in any way was asked of me over and over. Did I feel more Sudanese or more American? As if I had ever even had access to either side of that binary to claim, option A or option B, when of course the answer was always C, the third choice of the two, the third space, the hyphen, one of the conditions of my in-betweenness, my almostness, is feeling constantly between language, never fully belonging to one or the other, the guilt of feeling like I traded one for the other and ended up with an incomplete version of each. I have access to the two worlds that the two different languages contain, but I'm also never going to be entirely at home in either because part of me will always belong to the other one. I feel most comfortable speaking in a sort of hybrid language where the words can be in Arabic or in English and I don't have to make sure that what comes out of my mouth is entirely in a single language. I'm trying to exorcise some of that shame that comes from this lack of fluency by accepting that there's a third language that forms in the hybrid space between the two, between Arabic and English, and that is my language, the language I am fluent in. In situations where I'm most comfortable, that's the language I speak. My mother and I, or my brother and I, my cousins and childhood best friends, we speak in this combination of Arabic and English. The word comes out in whatever language it was thought in. And I'm trying to write poems that reflect what language sounds like in my head. Growing up bilingual made language my great obsession, my great trauma, and my great love. It's basically all I ever want to write about. So in the divorce, I separate to two piles. Books, English, love songs, Arabic. My angers, my schooling, my long repeating name. English, English, Arabic. I am someone's daughter, but I am American born. It shows in my short memory, my ahistoric glamour, my clumsy tongue when I forget the word for. In Arabic, I sleep unbroken dark hours on airplanes home, 
and dream I've missed my connecting flight. I dream a new and fluent mouth full of gauzy swaths of Arabic. I dream my alternate selves, each with a face borrowed from photographs of the girl who became my grandmother, brows and body rounded and cursive like Arabic, but wake to the usual borderlands. I crowd shining slivers of English to my mouth. Iris, crocus, inlet, heron. How dare I love a word without knowing it in Arabic? And what even is translation? Is immigration without irony? Safia means pure. All my life it's been true, even in my clouded Arabic. Before Home is Not a Country was a novel, it was a symptom of my obsession with the life I could have lived, the person I could have been, if I'd been born and raised in the country of my origins. I think often about something the poet Ladan Osman said in an interview. The most difficult part of negotiating both identities was not knowing if I was my authentic self, whether I'd be a different person had I grown up back home. I've also been obsessed for a long time with Mahmoud Darwish's In the Presence of Absence, where he writes, Longing is a misunderstanding between existence and borders. If I were there, you say, if I were there, my laugh would be louder and my speech clearer. I spent a lot of time thinking about the idea of alternate or parallel selves in the context of the diasporic experience. Who would I be if I had only, if I had only grown up back home? How would I be different? That sort of thing. The idea was originally just for one poem called Yasmin, about my obsession with the name I was almost given and the parallel life that might have come with that alternate name. The poem is a contrapuntal, two columns for the two possibilities, and then a third way of reading across the two columns, joining them, sealing the rift. Like my protagonist in Home is Not a Country, Ni'ma, I too was almost named Yasmin. Beyond that, the novel isn't autobiographical at all, but that one nugget from my actual life was the seed I planted from which the rest of the story blossomed. Uh, here's the poem, Yasmin. The only reason I'm queuing this up is because I have to do a bit of fiddling, so I'm going to read the left column, I'm going to read the right column, and then I'm going to read them across. I was born at the rupture, the root, where I split from my parallel self. I split from the girl I also could have been. And her name, Easy, I know the story. All her life, my mother wanted a girl named for a flower whose oil scents all our mothers, petals wrung for their perfume. I was planted. Land became ocean, became land anew, its shape refusing root in my fallow mouth, cleaving my life neatly, and my name taken from a dead woman to remember, to fill an aperture with cut jasmine in a bowl, our longing, our mother's wilting garlands hanging from our necks. And now for the trick. I was born, I was planted, at the rupture, the root, where land became ocean, became land anew. I split from my parallel self, I split from its shape refusing root in my fallow mouth, the girl I also could have been, cleaving my, my life neatly, and her name, Easy, I know the story, and my name, taken from a dead woman. All her life, my mother wanted to remember to fill an aperture with a girl named for a flower, cut jasmine in a bowl, whose oil scents all our longing, our mothers, our mothers, petals rung, wilting for their perfume, garlands hanging from our necks. For so long, I think I functioned from the idea, lived from the idea, wrote from the idea, that where I am from and where I exist were drastically different places, irreconcilably different even but I find myself growing, growing increasingly disillusioned by the governance of the border as a marker of anything, the governance of geography as a measure of figurative distance. For so long, I thought of myself as gone, as far away, aching to go back. But gone from where to where? Gone from what? Back to what? In a way, I think maybe what I am circling so much in my thinking these days is that I don't really know what a country is anymore and what it is anymore to be from a country. A country is so fallible, so temporary even. Borders move and mutate and sprout and grow like vines and spread. So maybe what I'm trying to say is that the landscape itself is begging me to find new language for it, 
after I've tried and failed over and over to articulate it in these terms of fromness and goneness and distance and absence. I spent so long mourning a country, a version of a country that was told to me as a story, that perhaps was only ever a story, that I never saw for myself and still I tied so much of how I identify myself up in it. I mourned some invented golden age of Sudan that probably wasn't as neat and tidy and narrativized as in actuality as it gets to be in retrospect, in nostalgia, in its absence and its haunting. Some golden age of Sudan that was deeply classed, deeply grayscale, deeply with its own set of costs and consequences. And still, I decided I was from there and that it was lost to me in being gone. And that because the place, or place in time really, that I felt such attachment to, because that place was gone, I couldn't have any identity except in terms of lack or absence or loss. But what is it to identify oneself using one's nationality? A nation is such a strange fiction, so arbitrary, because on the one hand, I am Sudanese, I feel incredibly Sudanese, but on the other hand, what is Sudan? Which Sudan? There are now formally two Sudans, and so many Sudans within those Sudans. So what is it exactly that I am gone from, that I ache to return to? My longing for a place, if pressed too hard, falls apart, because I don't know that I even necessarily have a concept of place. It all turns into place in time for me. So of course, I had to write a novel about time travel because my diasporic experience has primarily been an experience of time travel, of that slipperiness between place and time. So much about immigration has felt like time travel to me. The homeland forever preserved as the version of itself we left. So to claim that place, to be from that place, requires traveling backwards through time. This eternal limbo of being caught between past and future, past and future tense, the past tense of the idealized homeland, the imagined future of someday finally feeling at home in the host land, all while forgetting about the present. The present tense is my third space, that familiar in-between is the only tense I can live in. Warsan Shire writes, we took such care of tomorrow, but died on the way there. I want to take care of where I already am. Right now, I am here, happy to be here, and I want to take care of that, to really be here. In a few days, I'll be in Los Angeles, and I want to take care of that, to really be there. Next week, I travel randomly to Providence, Rhode Island, and for, a few, for the few days I spend there, I want to take care of that, to really be there, and so on. I've always wanted to belong to a city, to a place, to be deeply and undeniably local, but I never have. But I have always belonged to Sudanese communities, everywhere I've gone. Those are my people, rebuilding a life in the aftermath of great rupture. Those are the communities that taught me there are many Englishes, many Arabics, and that my language was my own to make, that my home was my own to make. I made home is not a country for those communities, for the aunties and uncles that taught us Arabic on Sundays in a rented classroom at a middle school. I made it for their children, my friend cousins, my infinite siblings, and the languages we invented together. I grew up in an invented world by the people among the people who built it with their own hands. So I grew up believing anything could be made and could be made real. Those handmade spaces, those hybrid approximations of one country inside another, those spaces are the closest I've ever come to feeling from anywhere. This is called Ode to Sudanese Americans. Basma and Rudy were first, each holding a mirror in her arms, where I could see my face as their faces. And we pierced our noses and wore a gamarboba in our ears, and everyone at the party thought them hoop earrings. And in the New York years, I crowd smoky bars alongside Ladin and Shadin and Majid and Linda and Nidal, Athil and Amir and Al-Khair, and Mo and Muhammad and Mo. And we are forever removing our shoes in each other's apartments ashing cigarettes into the incense burner, making tea with the good dried mint our mothers taught us to keep in the freezer next to the chili powder from home, making songs and dinner and jokes in our parents' accents. And I am funniest when I have two languages to cocktail, when I can say, remember, and everyone was there. 
the rented room at the middle school on Sundays where our parents volunteered to teach us Arabic, to watch us bleat, alif, ba, da, da, and text our American friends that we were bored. And at restaurants, everyone asks if we are related, and we say yes. We throw rent parties and project the video where al balabil sing guitar al shog and I am not the only one crying, not the only one made and remade by longing, the mutation that Arabic makes of my English, metallic noises the English makes in my Arabic, we ululate at each other's weddings, we ululate at the club, and Sarah and Hana make the mulah vegan. And in English, Sophia spells her name like mine, but pronounces it like purified, sews a patch of garmasis to the back of my denim jacket. We wash our underwear in the sink and make group texts on WhatsApp. We go home and take pictures of the pyramids. We go home and take pictures of the Nile. We move to other cities and feel doubly diasporic. And your cousin's co-worker's little sister, emails me a list of bigalas in Oakland, brings me crates of canned fava beans from her own parents' basement. And I say Sudanese American and mean also British Sudanese and Canadian and Australian and raised in the Gulf, Azza and Yusra and Amani and Yasmin. And it's true that my people are everywhere. The uncle is driving taxis at the end of our nights. The pharmacist who fills my prescription, who is named for the mole denoting beauty adorning her left cheek, guardian spirits of my every hookah bar, of my every untagged photograph, of crop tops and short shorts and pierced cartilage and tattoos, of henna and headscarves and undercuts and shaved heads, my tapestries embroidered with hundreds of little mirrors, glinting like sequins in the changing light. My mother says a lot, I made home, and I think that really helps me combat this notion of home as a fixed static location that I can only hope to find if I were to just learn the right vocabulary word or tradition or recipe. Instead, it presents the option of home as a portable environment, home as a decision, a project, people, a community, rather than a country. A country is fallible, is at the mercy of its governments and their wars. A country, ultimately, was once itself created by the drawing of a man-made border. So what is a country but the drawing of a line? Today, I draw thick black lines around my eyes, and they are a country. And thick red lines around my lips, and they are a country. And the knife that chops the onions draws a smooth line through my finger, and that is a country. And the tightening denim presses a soft purple line into my belly. And when I smile like my mother, a line flashes between my two front teeth. And for every country I lose, I make another, and I make another. If home is about love and community and care, not about borders, which are made up, or about countries, which are also made up, then my communities and my family and my friendships are the spaces where I can heal from the failures of larger constructs of nation and citizenship and allegiance. I think I actually don't care anymore where I belong because I know who I belong to, who I am accountable to. And I wanted to honor that in this book, down to the title, those little interpersonal spaces that feel like home when the larger questions about home feel so unanswerable. That love of and need for community is what made me a poet, is what made it stick. I had a million hobbies as a child. I tried playing the flute and violin and drew badly and tried to knit. I would pick up all these things and then quickly abandon them. When I first got into poetry, I thought it would be the same. I felt such loneliness as a teen. It felt, I think, particularly lonely to be an artsy kid. It felt like everyone else was off being normal. Then I remember going to an open mic for the first time, and it was just this incredible group of weirdos. And I thought, these are my people. If all I have to do to keep getting to hang out with these people is write some poems, I will write a million poems. Just please letting me, keep letting me be part of this community. So that kept me coming back. I thought poems were fine. But early on, I didn't feel a particular spark or magic or think it was like my calling or even something I was particularly good at. I just loved poetry spaces and poets and the poetry community. Everyone talked to everyone. It was a cozy, welcoming space, and I wanted to be part of it. It kept me coming back long enough that I started to learn things and have creative impulses and an artistic point of view. So I became a member of a poetry community and a poet at the same time. Becoming a poet also made me, in some ways, belong more deeply to my family. My grandfather, Tayyib Hasab Rasul al-Kogali, Allah 
was a poet. And uh, today is his birthday. Um, and I am nothing if not my grandfather's girl, performing always into that archetype he created for me. So much of my poet's life is an approximation of his, gathered with my friends, dreaming and debating, reciting a favorite poem we've memorized. I can picture him now, settled comfortably into a chair, his feet propped up on a leather stool, revising a poem, reading for hours, reciting from his seemingly endless memory. There are names I heard first in his voice before encountering them later in study, in essays and articles about the great Arabic language poets of old. Whenever I return home, to any of my homes, as I cross the threshold or get off the plane or fit my key into the lock, I hear the echo of his voice reciting over and over the famous Ilya Bumadi poem, Watana Nijumi Ana Huna, Man Ana, Homeland of the Stars, I am here. Do you recognize who I am? Theodore Adorno says, for a man who no longer has a homeland, writing becomes a place to live. I love poems because I love my community. Yes, of course I love language, but I think that wouldn't be enough on its own. Maybe that alone wouldn't have kept me from moving on and getting really into something else eventually. I write poems because I'm excited to show them to my community. Everything I have ever written has been an offering to someone I love. Sometimes that person is myself. In the case of home is not a country, that person is my teenage self. But just sitting in a circle and reading poems aloud to each other was such a big part of my adolescence and young adulthood. Wherever we were, even at a party or something, by the end of the night we'd be in that circle, somebody reading out poems. I need to continue to spend time in that feeling because that's the engine. It's not to prove how smart I am or show I can write a metaphor because honestly, who cares? I just want to make my friends laugh or shed a tear and snap their fingers and give me edits. I just want the kids I went to Sudanese school with on Sundays to be like, I remember that. I want my grandfather to smile and nod and ask me to read it again. So I do have a home in my communities, in my groups of friends, in my family. And this is what I pledge allegiance to when flags continue to fail me. I have always felt at home in books too, even as a young reader. It just maybe felt for a long time like a home where I didn't have my own room. So now I am trying to build that room, one poem at a time, one book at a time. I am a person who feels so deeply of the third spaces that form in between worlds, cultures, languages, and now in between genres. What is a novel in verse, if not that kind of hybrid third space? Much like being a hyphenated American or a diasporic being or a teenager, which is this third space in between childhood and adulthood. It just felt like all these things were a version of each other. The novel in verse is a hybrid form. The diasporic experience is a hybrid form. Adolescence is a hybrid form. So it means a lot to me for my first novel to be a novel for young people. It started out as an offering to my younger self, the young reader I was who's the reason I am a writer today. I wanted to make a book that would have made it all feel possible for me sooner. It took me a while to really believe that my life and my experiences were deserving of poetry, of literature, because I wasn't seeing my particular intersections in any book. So I wanted to tell a story about a young person who is not me, but who contains my intersections. And I wanted to offer this story to someone who is the age now that I was then, to hopefully add a little bit to the conversation they might be having with themselves about what is possible in a book and maybe make a home for that in that possi for, and maybe make a home for them in that possibility and maybe making a home for them in that book that's enough to keep me writing little homes for all my loved ones for all my people that's my hope i surprise myself with how hopeful i am and now uh, to close after spending all this time talking about the book without actually reading from it uh, I'm going to end with a small excerpt. Um, so it's a novel in verse, which uh, just means that it's a novel in that it's a long form story, but each section, each chapter, each scene is written as a poem. Um, so I'm going to read you one poem called Nostalgia Monster. Haytham calls me a nostalgia monster and likes to laugh at the dream brain that takes over mine when I hear the old songs and run my fingers over the old photographs. I know the words to the old films, 
and imagine myself gliding in to join the dance, glamorous in black and white, photographed in sepia, frozen in a perfect time. I wish our Arabic teacher would tell us more about what it was like back then, before everyone left, when they were young and dreaming and hearing the songs crackling out of a radio, but I cannot imagine him young or dancing, cannot imagine him any way except the way we know him now, scowling over conjugations and how we mispronounce the language, how it wilts on our American tongues. One of my favorites is a Sayyid Khalifa song where he sings to a girl he calls a pearl necklace, Ya Igdaluli Luli, Ya Bit Ya Hilwa Ya Luli, and says, Wain al Hilween, Wain Rahu, where are the beautiful ones? Where did they go? And I think he means us, all the ones who left, all the gone. Thank you. That was wonderful, thank you. Um, and just a personal thank you for both Safi and Chris who've been on campus all week working with our students. It's been a wonderful, wonderful experience, so thank you again. Can we have a last round of applause? Due to logistic issues, we have a small number of books available at the front here. Um, there will be much more on campus over the next few days if you wish to purchase them. Thank you. <laughs>